Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down today, nothing gold can stay. Welcome to It's Always Sunny in Hollywood. My name is Patrick. Uh, I'm Red, uh, drum arts. And yeah. I'm Lugia, and poetry was never my thing. I don't know how to follow up on that. Were you, you're expecting me to do something more, more, I guess? More brash. Hey, we gotta meet for the rumble at uh, 2 a.m. Oh, come on, come on, guys. It's, it's a good boys. poem. It's a good yeah, poem, no, come it's on. It's a great poem, it's a great poem. So, yes, we're talking about The Outsiders, but before we get to that, um, woohoo! Yeah, so Charles Martinet was announced to, he will no longer be playing Mario. He's still going to be working at Nintendo in, like, some capacity, I guess, is like, yeah, not, uh, he will not be voicing the Mario character. Um, that surprised me, because I still think his voice is, like, pretty good. It's not like, um, I don't know, like Mel Blanc in the last few years where he kind of lost his voice. Like, I feel like Charles Martinet still got it, but... I guess they're, it's a precautionary measure. Is it confirmed that Mario's voice in Super Mario Wonder is not Charles Martinet? Yeah, it's not. Okay. Yeah, it's not him. I don't know who it is, though. What a year to be a Mario fan, right? And to think the last yeah. time we heard uh, Charles' voice in a recent Mario media was his father, and the last line he said in that movie was, Those are my boys! <laughs> We've come full yeah, circle. We got, we got a new movie, a new 2D game, and a new voice actor. Not to mention the remake of RPG, so. How fucked up would be if the guy who voices him in Wonder is Chris Pratt? It'd be like, what the fuck? It's not. There's no I know it's not. Way. There's, there's, no, there's no way. It, they, one, they would not, like, be able to pay that much. But, like, yeah, that's, that's too expensive. And I'm looking up at, when I'm looking up the cast for Super Mario Wonder, it doesn't say who Mario is, but apparently uh, Kenny James plays Bowser. Like, they got some people for, there's a list for, like, the other people. Now look, Kenny James have played Bowser for years, so that's not a surprise. And I guess similar but more tragic news, uh, Arlene Sorkin passed away. She's best known for, um, well, she was the inspiration for and the original voice actor for Harley Quinn. Uh, Bruce Timm, uh, so she was a voice actor in like some other cartoons, and Bruce Timm just really liked her, and he wanted her to be on the show, Batman. So he basically made up Harley Quinn for her. And, uh, yeah, and it, uh, ultimately, Harley Quinn, you know, obviously became a very iconic character in her own right. And arguably, you know, the, probably the, one of Batman's most popular characters. So, yeah, rest in peace, Arlene. Yeah, uh, so th there's a soap opera called Days of Her Lives, and, uh, in that, she played a jester in, um, in, uh, the soap opera Days of Our Lives. So, uh, Paul Dini, you know, saw that. And, um, you know, Paul Dean was, uh, the co-creator of Batman the Animated Series and friends with Arlene, so he was like, yeah, cool, I'll, I'll make her that, and, um, try to incorporate as many you know, parts of her personality, so yeah. And, uh, apparently it was just, like, her normal voice, her normal Brooklyn accent, and she just kind of emphasized the Yiddish part a little bit. Anyway, uh, one more, I guess, passing away news is that Bob Barker passed away, he was, uh, the host of The Price is Right. He passed away at 99, which I think is, you know, interesting because, you know, the gimmick of The Price is Right is, you know, you never go over and he never, you know, he never hit 100. I thought Price is Right was a good show. I saw the episode where they got Jesse Pinkman on. I mean, before he was Jesse Pinkman, but you know what I mean. You guys ever see that episode? Uh, not uh, that episode in particular. I think I only no. caught a couple, but I don't exactly remember who was on. I'll be honest, I've always been more of a Wheel of Fortune guy. Yeah, that's fair. Um, no, but the, the... I remember when Breaking Bad, like, got popular, like, a lot of people were kind of sharing around that episode, so I, like, so I saw it, and it was pretty funny, because you had, um, Aaron Paul, who plays Jesse in the show, he was apparently on The Price is Right when he was, uh, younger, and, um, he was fucking, like, he went ape shit. he was like, yo, I fucking love it. like, he was like, he was like a very hyped up, he was very hyped up. It was funny is um when I saw the video, I didn't know it was him. I just thought that people were just sharing a very funny host on uh the Price is Right because like I think that video could have gone viral even if you know the guy in it wasn't famous. But then like after I like looked in the description and it was like oh shit that's Aaron Paul, that's Jesse, that's my favorite character on TV. You know, second favorite now, but uh, who's number one? 
Uh, Saul Goodman. <laughs> I mean, same ah. universe, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, just uh, that's it for the debts. Um, you take it away, Patrick. All right. It is now time that we talk about the Francis Ford Coppola directed Essie Hinton adaptation of 1983. Rumble fit now. <laughs> The Outsiders, though. It's weird that both were released in the same year. No, no. Basically, what happened is um after the Outsiders, kind of I know like, both films know, were worked. I know both films were kind of shot back to back. Yeah, like basically after the Outsiders, he like, like on a whim, he decided to I guess shoot the film, and uh, it shares like a, a couple cast members. You know, obviously Matt Dillon, but uh, yeah, no, they were they were kind of worked on together. Yeah, so he he wrote the screenplay while like shooting the outsiders and then um decided you know basically just kind of asked the crew like hey guys want to just like keep this running for like a couple more weeks and then they shot a second movie so the outsiders as said this is directed by francis ford coppola based on the book of the same name by essie hinton and released in 1983 so why did the director of the godfather decide to make an adaptation of the outsiders well the answer is it wasn't his choice he all started yeah. It all started to? when he got a what? He was forced to. So what happened was he got a letter from a high school librarian saying that her students loved the outsider book so much that they wanted him to make a film adaptation because they thought he was the only one who could do it justice. And you know, Coppola not being one to destroy dreams was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And that wasn't the only reason, though. I know it resonated with him as well. No, he, he no, liked the book. No, it wasn't just that. Um, it was also the fact that he was broke as shit um, at the time. That too. Because uh, uh, him and his buddy George Lucas, they were both uh, gunning for two uh, independently funded movies at the time. Uh, Coppola's was um, One from the Heart, and uh, Lucas's was Empire Strikes Back. Um, naturally, Lucas was the successful case. Coppola was not. One from the Heart was an infamous bomb. And um, from then he kind of had to take a lot more um safer kind of studio uh roots and um he was lucky that you know he did still connect with the outsider so like it wasn't like a complete selling out but he he very much did this because um uh he needed the money and uh you know it's it's pretty safe to like go to like um a studio and be like hey this is a classic book that everyone likes so you know safe bet i will not <laughs> lose you a lot of money <laughs> So when the opportunity right. came to him, he just grabbed it first chance he could get. Yeah, basically. All right. Well, here's something, Red, I bet you didn't know about the production. Uh, it wasn't Coppola. It was his producer. When his producer went to try to get the rights to make The Outsiders from Hinton, she was, she was very hesitant. She's like, I'm not so sure about this. He's like, yeah, but it's the director of The Godfather and Apocalypse Now. He wants to make this book. I mean, he wants to make the movie. And she's still like, hmm. But you know what changed her mind? What? I oh, don't know this part. All right. What changed her mind was was finding out that Coppola was a producer on the 1979 film adaptation of The Black Stallion. Interesting. A hmm. According to, according to an article I found, she was a fan of the book and thought that the movie did it justice. So she's like, I guess this guy does have an affinity for this type of thing. So I think we're in good hands. It's just interesting to me, like, you know, Godfather Apocalypse Now, no, that doesn't sell it. Black Stallion, that's what. <laughs> but, no, um, Coppola had Hinton on extensively through production to oversee everything. She helped him write the screenplay, and everything from the costumes to the locations was given to her to make sure it was as authentic to the book as possible. And she also had a cameo appearance as Derry's nurse. So, when it came to casting, um, instead of having a regular casting call... Coppola had all the actors in one room in a circle watch each other audition. Is a much different experience because you're more aware of other people and you try to, you know, you try to make decisions based on what other people did. It sounds like the actors would just one up each other if that was the case. Kind of. I mean, I've been in that type of situation before, and yeah, you do take notes from what other people do. So it's a much different experience than just being the only one in the room. Anyway, throughout production, the cast would constantly pull pranks on each other. And one, one of the more funny ones I found was one day after filming, uh, the, the guy who played Pony Boy, C. Thomas Howell, he returned to his hotel room and found that everything had been flipped upside down. <laughs> like, even like, the small, like, 
even the smallest things like like a like a penny on the floor was like that was there in the morning was flipped flipped on on heads just because know. just because just because you know a bunch of wisecrackers these guys uh, the film originally had a runtime of 114 minutes, but Warner Brothers pressed Coppola to cut it down to 90. Though a complete novel release was released in 2005 that restored those deleted scenes. But for clarity's sake, for this episode, we're just going to talk about the theatrical release. That's the one you guys saw, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the Outsiders released in 1983, where it was well received critically and on a budget of 10 million, grossed 33.7 million. But that's not exactly where it ends, because in 2016, rapper Danny Boy O'Connor bought the house that was used as the Curtis's residence and turned it into a museum. Just for clarity's sake, we've all, we've all read the book, right? Yeah, at some point yeah. in school. Random question, do, yeah, you know I... parents, do, you know, do you know if your parents read the book in school? That I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Because I asked my parents, and they said it was not required reading when they were in school. Maybe, oh, the, movie, uh... maybe the movie's release kind of skyrocketed it. And made it required reading. I don't know. It's pretty easy to get kids to you know read if you're like, hey, you know, it's uh, you get to see a movie after you finish reading the book. You know, <laughs> that's what that's what we did. Yeah, no. First time I saw this movie was after I read the book. Um, it was before I think I think this might be like the first Francis Ford Coppola movie I saw too. No, this this was mine because I I didn't watch Godfather until just a few years ago. And Lugia, you said you've never seen the Outsiders movie beforehand. Correct. This is my first viewing. I did read the book. It's just that my class never saw the movie afterwards. I remember I read this in, I think, my AP English class in seventh grade. I read it in middle school, too. Mm -hmm. Also, I think I read Animal Farm the same year. And uh, it's really funny because The Outsiders and Animal Farm are like two of the only books I ever read for school that I liked, like when I read it in school versus like, you know, other books, you know, for me to like it, I have to revisit it at like a later date. Um... No, similar so, case for me. The Outsiders was the first book I read in school I recall actually really liking. Yeah, so I'm wondering if that's the book or if we just had, like, a good teacher, because... It's possible. Uh, yeah. We weren't in the same class when we read this one. Yeah, but I think we had the same teacher. Also, random question. In seventh grade, did you guys read a book called Stargirl? Yeah, I do not remember I... shit about it. I, I don't e about Stargirl. I don't either. The only thing I do remember is that everyone in my class hated the main character. Is there a movie adaptation of Stargirl? I think there is. There I, is. I, I I haven't seen it, and I don't really. have There is. It's on. Uh, it's on Disney Plus. It, uh, again, I don't remember much of the oh, book. Oh, this Stargirl. Yeah, I remember it now. Yeah, this was like one of those like manic pixie dream girl kind of stories. I just remember it's a girl. She's kind of weird and quirky, and people like her, but then something happens, and they don't like her anymore. Yeah, it's a manic pixie dream girl story. One of those like classic things. Like it, I think it deconstructs a little bit, but like oh, I don't know. It's whatever. It's a pretty meh, in my opinion. Anyway, let's let's get back to the outsiders. So the plot. So in the town of Tusla, Oklahoma, there's a vision. There's a division between greasers and socials, or socials as they're called. One night, two of the greasers, named Ponyboy and Johnny, are assaulted by a group of socials, and in an act of self-defense, Johnny kills one of them with a switchblade knife. Horrified by the reality of the situation, Ponyboy and Johnny decide to run away. But then they save a group of children from a burning church and get hailed as heroes by the newspaper. However, the Soshas are obviously mad at them for killing one of their members and demand that a rumble be held between them and the Greasers. Let's just clarify some terminology. So Greasers are basically like uh, poor Italian uh, gangsters. And um, Soshas are just like preppy, like wealthy kids. Um, and a rumble is... I personally right. think it's a very dumb it's idea, but fight. it's basically just like a big fight. It's like an organized fist fight. Basically. Which is, uh, you might, they had one West Side Story, if any of you have seen that, so you know. This did remind me a lot of West Side Story, with like, the Soshas and the Greasers just being like the Jets and the Sharks. Same here. They fight over a girl, yeah. kind of. Well, not really. I feel like, I, I like this more than West Side Story, um, at least, uh, like the original West Side Story movie. I just like, I guess, connect with the characters a bit more, and I feel I kind of like the more casual vibe of it all. Although I really do like Spielberg's take on West Side Story, so yeah, I don't know. So if I can start for a second, um, 
This was an interesting film to rewatch because I said I really liked the book and I remember liking the movie the first time I saw it. But surprisingly, I did not remember as much from the book as I thought I did. Because what I remember is that, you know, there's there's two different classes, the Soshas and the Greasers. They kill a guy and then they hide away in a church for a few days. That yeah, I remember. The, I, I did, did not, not remember, remember any the burning of the third church. Act. Yeah, the the only two scenes I remembered was um this the stabbing scene and uh, them saving the kids from the fire. That's it. I didn't well, remember like the whole kind of first act, and I did not remember the last act. Certainly, I did not Lord, remember the no, suicide I just, by cop. I remembered I remembered the first two acts, but not yeah. the third act. So it was really weird being I, like, huh. Also, I remembered I remember Johnny saying "Stay Gold, Pony Boy," but I I that that was it though. Just like those three. Oh, well, that's the most iconic line in the book. Luke, what did you remember? I didn't remember. I don't remember. I didn't remember like the, the, the ending where like explains why he stayed gold. So I'm just like, stay gold, pony boy. I was like, does he like his hair? Like the blonde hair? Like, yeah. <laughs> so having only seen the book, my memory of this is very, very hazy. And I also had to use my imagination to piece everything together when I read it. So I remember the Greasers versus the, the Socias. I remember a few key characters like Johnny, Pony Boy, and Daryl. Uh, I remember the inciting incident, but everything after that, I completely forgot about. Like, so we're we're basically all on the same page, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just one more thing. So I remembered Ralph Macchio being in this movie. I did not remember any of the other celebrities when Tom oh, yeah. Cruise showed I up. I was like, Tom Cruise is in this. I forgot <laughs> to mention this, Tom Cruise I, is in I this. I forgot to mention this movie has a stacked cast. That's but there's, one, of the, there, one of the most noteworthy things about before it. Before they became like famous, like Ralph Macchio got famous because of the Karate Kid. Tom Cruise became famous after this. Yeah, Patrick Rob Swayze Lowe, in here as well. <laughs> yeah, Rob Lowe, Patrick Swayze, uh, Emilio Estevez, it's Diane hoot, Lane. This was a, it's another hoot situation. It's like, yeah. damn, these people. Flea is in the movie. What? Yeah, Flea's like a background character. He's like one of the random socias. Really? He's an, he's an extra? Yeah, Flea's Jeez. an extra. <laughs> Flea from the... Re the musician Flea, you know, like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Do we yeah, need to establish I, no, the Outsiders cinematic universe now? No, it's not cinematic universe, there's just actors, but yeah. Okay, so Tom Waits is in there. So enough of the connections. I didn't, I didn't remember, wait, I didn't remember seeing Tom Waits. Tom Waits was in there? Buck Merrill. Oh, shit, that was him? All right, so enough of the connections and what we remembered and what we didn't remember. What do we think of the movie? I really liked it. Um, I, I liked it about as much as I did as a kid. Like, I, I it's a nice kind of, like, I liked, like, the more casual stuff a lot. Um, and I also, I really liked the main, like, three characters, uh, Pony Boy, Johnny, and um, I I'm surprised by how much I like Dallas because Dallas is kind of like a prick, but like he's an incredibly likable prick. And um, you know, especially with the last act, you know, kind of centers around him, and it's like I I really you know felt for him. I yeah, I really no, like Dallas. Yeah, and I really enjoyed this as well. I remember when I read the book, I loved the characters, yeah. and seeing them here again was just like meeting yeah. old friends in a way so yeah. initially well, when i read the book i completely forgot about dallas until i started watching it i'm like oh that just unlocked a core memory i remember this guy he was a fucking asshole but as i yeah. watched more of the movie like actually no he's just he's just a guy with I, his heart in the right place it's just he doesn't have a good way of showing it i think matt dylan's performance is like i think is the best performance in the movie like i i really liked it um it also uh, one thing when watching it, while watching it is, um, man, James Franco must have really fucking liked this movie yeah. <laughs> because, um, one, he looks very similar to Matt Dillon, but two, like, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the TV show Freaks and Geeks, but it's very clear to me that, uh, he was, he was modeling, um, himself off of Matt Dillon and, like, James Dean. Like, it's very clear to me. Like, th those are, like, Franco's, like, two big influences, James Dean and, uh, Matt Dillon. The first act, like, really, I really liked it. Like, the, the whole, like, you know, theater scene and all the uh, the chemistry with Cherry and, like, oh, you know. Uh, the, the line that really stood out to me was, like, you know, uh, you know, basically when she was, like, saying, don't take it personally, you know, when I, uh, when I pretend I don't know you at school and all that stuff. And I was, like, I don't know, everything about that really uh, clicked with me. And um, 
especially because um of the soundtrack, which I think was like the secret like MVP of the movie, because I thought this soundtrack was fucking amazing. Like people talk about Scorsese's soundtrack, but I thought this like perfectly like captured the tone. Um it set up a really nice atmosphere and it was all like, you know, time appropriate too. So it was like I think this is like generally one of the best soundtracks I've ever seen in a movie. Also, like the original score and themes are pretty good. But like, yeah, I, I, the, this is like a, a quintessential vibe movie to me. Like, uh, I know like you guys really like Days and Confused. Like, th- this is what uh, I guess what Days and Confused was to like other people. This is this is to me. This is I'm like, dazed, okay. This is this is the Days and Confused of the eighties. Sure, or I guess the fifties, but yeah. Actually, no, like of the eighties because Days and Confused is like a throwback to the seventies. So like. Mm-hmm. And this is the throwback to the 50s. Okay, yeah. No, makes sense, yeah. Um, the movie that takes place in the 80s. Days and Confused is a 70s movie that takes place in the 90s. It's going to make my brain right. explode. Strike that, reverse it. Strike that, reverse it. So I'm assuming, so what, uh, based on what you said about Dallas, he, uh, I mean, yeah, no, Dallas, he's your favorite character? Yeah. It, it's kind of tough, though, because I really do like, um, I thought Ralph Macho's performance here was like, shockingly good especially because like you no know, i know him for like you know the karate kid movies i feel like it's like a it's a similar but very different performance like pony boy here and I, it's partially because you know ralph mount is a much more baby face here but like he feels like so much more vulnerable here than like he does in the karate kid and the, and the karate kid is like even though it's only like a year later it's got like a similar i don't know it just ralph mount just feels a lot more vulnerable and um I, I feel like johnny is like the soul of the movie yeah yeah, he's definitely the heart of the film. And Absolutely. um the Kid also had like a kind of thing with like bullying like by like preppy kids and you being like this so this Italian dude and this getting ragged on. So there's a little, some parallels there. But yeah. So what did you guys think of the cinematography? Because um I noticed that the cinematography here like ha- a good chunk of the movie feels very naturalistic, but every once in a while it'll become like incredibly stylized. And um the most standout I, shot to me was when it's a shot of the lake while Johnny and Pony are talking, and then Pony with their like, reflection. Tosses a, yeah, P- Pony tosses a rock, and then it it ripples. That was that the was a good shot. Me. Also, when they're looking at the sunset, that that one scene. Well, the sunset one uh, uh, stood out to me because um. So you know how they reference Gone with the Wind in this film a lot? Yeah. A lot of these shots are actually like direct homages to the cinematography in Gone with the Wind. So like uh, the scene you're referring to, this this is. This is like how Gone with the Wind looks. That's what I meant by like it, it bounces between naturalistic and stylized. A lot of yeah, like the stylized yeah, elements right. are like specifically throwing back to how Gone with the Wind looked. And I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of interesting. I was like, was like he really like understood like his book. Because it was like, okay. Also, that, that's, that must have been like interesting like reading as a kid. It was like, you know, reading a book and they, they reference another book. And I'm like, okay. Well- I wonder how many kids who were got drawn into reading by the outsiders got drawn to Gone with the Wind because of it. Were you? Yeah. No. I've never read Gone with the Wind. I've never even seen it. I mean, I didn't just because, like, as a kid, I was like, oh, man, like, it's like a four-hour movie, and I was like, I don't want to see that. Wait, it is? Gone with the Wind is a very long film. Very it long is, movie. It is four hours. Like, I'm not joking. It's longer than, like, Shole, man. It is... Actually, for what it's, it's worth... It's three hours and 58 minutes long. Speaking of getting back into the reading, the 1939 I... film. Yes. Yeah. It is. Oh my god! It actually is those just mo- under four hours. Um. So, like Bollywood movies, uh, those movies had intermissions back in the day. So, Gone with the Wind has an intermission. So, like, you'd see the first two hours, then take like a twenty-minute break, and then see the next two hours. So, like, it wasn't like, you know, you watching four hours straight, but you know. So, oh, for what it's worth, speaking of getting back into reading, I actually did start reading the book The Outsiders again because of this. So, what do you think of it? I remember, like, from my memory of the book and the movie, it's like, there's the movies that are, like, worse than the books, and there are the movies that are, like, perfect adaptation, and there are the movies that are, like, elevated it. I thought this was, like, a perfect adaptation, but I didn't think it elevated it. Partially because, like, when I think of The Outsiders, I do think of the book first. I feel like it's, like, on par with the book, and, like, obviously your first experience is the one that's going to stick with you, so, like, book just sticks with me more, because it was the first one. Versus, like, I don't know, like, The Shining, where, like, it's a good book, but the movie just sticks with me more. It's, like, it's a better movie, I think, and, like, and the movie, I think, like, does its kind of own thing, where here, I just think, like, hopefully he just want to tell, like, a perfect adaptation, and that's it. 
Again, he, um, he did he did care enough to have the actual author on board to oversee everything. So that's what I'm saying. It's a perfect adaptation, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, me saying it doesn't elevate is not a criticism. Like, I just think it's a perfect adaptation. Are there any um, key differences in the I, book? Well, in comparison well, the to the theatrical cut, yeah. Yes. But, yeah. The theatrical cut starts... No, um, yeah, the theatrical cut starts differently because the book starts off... Actually, this is kind of funny. This is, weirdly, a much smoother transition to Cars than I thought because the book starts with Ponyboy walking home after seeing a Paul Newman film. Speed. I am speed. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he's he's walking home and he gets jumped by some socias and then his buddies come in to help him. So far, I mean, I haven't finished the book, uh, but that is like the biggest difference so far. Okay. Uh, if we're talking about the book and the movie or comparing them, there's one thing. Um, this might be a nitpick, but even when I was in seventh grade and I saw the movie, this stood out to me. And that is the scene where Ponyboy decides to run away. So in the movie... Gary pushes him, and that is, like, the final straw. In the book, he slaps him. Like, slaps him hard. It knocks him against the wall. I feel like Mm. that's more justified because that's a more personal interaction between the two brothers instead of just him pushing Ponyboy. Yeah, granted, it is a hard push, but I feel like a slap is, like, you know, a slap is harder. Like, a push is, like, things are boiling. A slap is action. Like, you actively have to get into Ponyboy's personal space to do that slap. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. And in the what's, what's weird is that throughout the movie, through that second half, he keeps saying, like, oh, my brother slapped, my brother hit me. I'm like, no, no, he didn't. I don't know. That's, that's the one thing that always stood out to me is why. Maybe Coppola yeah. thought the slap would be too graphic? I don't know. Uh, people die in this movie. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but, like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I guess fam- fam- famil- familial, like, I don't know. I guess familial shit is a the bit drinking, more, guess, the touchy. drinking, yeah, like the drinking and the smoking and the stabbing. That's all fine, but a slap. Oh God, forbid. Yeah, but it's like domestic abuse, which is like has a bit, a bit more of a touchy connotation to it than uh, fighting someone else. Oh yeah, at one point the movie, the movie jump scares you with a train crash. In his nightmare sequence? Yes, because Ponyboy's falling asleep, and you think, oh, it's going to be a montage of the times he had with his parents. Nope! Yeah. A car gets run over by a train, and the camera just rotates around. Okay, I'm going to be honest, that shot didn't do it for me, just because of how the camera rotates. That's fair. It just looked yeah, that... off, and I mean, I get it, it's supposed to be a dream, but it didn't look right. Yeah, but overall, this is a great adaptation. Yeah, no. With... Oh, yeah. Um, I do think it's funny, like, Coppola really, really likes to be faithful with his adaptations, because, like, his Godfather adaptation, very much, like, he got the original author on board, even though, like, the author hates Hollywood, apparently, and, uh, the dialogue's almost beat for beat, and, like, his adaptation of Dracula is apparently, like, one of the most accurate adaptations of the book. I just feel like those two were, had a bit more, like, cinematic invention to him when, like, I actually think this move is an interesting precursor to Dracula, because, uh, Dracula also tries to kind of kind of have like an old Hollywood type stylization to this uh, cinematography, um, but it's you know, uh, in a landscape that very much like favors naturalism. So he's kind of like kind of blending the two styles. And I feel Dracula was like a much more active and consistent blending. And this was more of like naturalism. And then every once in a while you'll have like a super stylized shot. And it was like, but I, the thing is interesting. I kind of feel like you know this was him trying to play around with the balance that uh he would do in his later films. I also think this is interesting, like, like in comparison to his film, uh, Peggy Sue Got Married, because that's also, like, a, a movie that kind of revels in the nostalgia of the 50s. If I can go off on a tangent for a second. So, yes. funny, funny coincidence, this past week it was announced that a musical adaptation of The Outsiders is coming to Broadway next year. And the team right now, it's people I don't really recognize. Uh, a book by Adam Rapp and Justin Levine, and, musics, and music by... Jamestown Revival. Do you guys know that band? No. I do. Yeah. Are they good? Do you like them? I mean, I, I ain't listen to them. I just know that they exist. Okay. Uh, but there is one person attached uh, that I find interesting, and that is... Actually, let me just make... Confer- okay, yeah. Um, Angelita Jolene is producing it. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. And I have I have some thoughts about this, about the announcement of an Outsiders musical. Like, like when I first heard it, I'm like... Oh, that's interesting. But the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, West Side Story kind of 
did this. Yeah. I mean, like, like, you, like you guys said, we were reminded of West Side Story, and it's a similar thing with the class division and the violence and everything. And they kind of end the same way. So, like, I love the characters of The Outsiders, but... I mean, there are like, a couple I, I, differences between the two stories, but for the most part, it's primarily the same. Like, you have two different opposing factions. There's a girl in the uh, the opposite one that another guy from the, the, the Greasers is in love with. It's like, on a surface level, they're the same. Like, I'm not against this idea. I'm just like, I hope it's not derivative. Even even some of the other aspects of the Outsiders that aren't similar to West Side Story, I get vibes of other shows. For example, um, with Johnny, the relationship between Johnny and the rest of the group, that kind of reminds me of the relationship that Crutchy had in Newsies with everybody else. I mean, I'm speaking for the show. I haven't seen the movie Newsies. In the mu- in the stage adaptation, he's kind of like the fragile one. He's he's the one everybody likes, and nobody would dare like hurt in any way and he's also in the second half of the show he's torn away from the group and everybody's like well we gotta we gotta fight for him we gotta fight to get him back so i'm like even even the heart there has kind of already been done with newsies like i said i'm not i'm down for the idea i just hope it's not derivative i guess time will tell time will tell it opens next year so i'm I'm gonna be cautiously optimistic about this you guys have any further thoughts? Uh, if I see it, I just hope it'll be different. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's funny that we've talked about a bunch of Francis Ford Coppola movies, except the big one. The big one being Captain EO, starring Michael Jackson. No, no. The uh, bi- Come on, dude. The big one's Jack. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Michael Jackson's like in a lot of like random space shit. This is like Captain EO was a space captain, then he was in Space Channel 5 as Spice Michael, where Space Michael. They directly re- Yeah, where they directly reference the events of Moonwalker. And he's also a captain in Space Channel 5. And he's like, he was apparently like obsessed with E.T. Like Michael Jack he was a Men in Black too, like as a and in that they implied he was an alien or like he wanted to join the organization. It was like, man, he's in a lot of like weird alien shit, huh? Actually, uh one more funny thing bef- actually, do we have anything else to say about the outsiders? I don't think so. Other than West Side Story, were we reminded of anything else? The TV show Freaks and Geeks, I guess. This may sound kind of weird, but the middle half of this movie kind of reminded me of the first half of Luca. Luca also kind of reminded me of Poker also. Which is, so, yeah. It all connects somehow. So, if you like, so yeah, if you like The Outsiders, check out Freaks and Geeks, West Side Story, and Luca. And before we officially wrap up, I have one, f- one final thing to say about Essie Hinton, which I thought was kind of funny. So the Outsiders movie turned uh, 40 this year, and there was an interview, there was a written interview she did with somebody talking about the legacy of the Outsiders. And she starts off the interview by saying, just want you to know, this is probably the last time I'm ever going to talk about the Outsiders. I've answered every possible question, and I'm kind of sick of it. Just once, can somebody ask me about Rumblefish? All right, Miss Hinton, I will ask you about Rumblefish should I ever meet you in person. But first, I got to read Rumblefish, because the only question I got right now is, what's Rumblefish? So, um, all right. Wow, yeah. she's still alive. Yeah. Also, she's a woman. I, I did not realize that. Because S.C. Hinton, like, you know, you don't... Neutral. Susan she, Eloise. She intended, it, she intended it to be that way. I mean, anyway. Lots of authors anyway, that. Red, your turn. Yeah, so... Uh, because uh, we're taking a week off, I figured, uh, well, why not do a, a double feature? But, you know, don't worry. I was just trying to think of, like, you know, um, he isn't a director, but he's a very, like, important um, actor, an important figure. And um, he's an international figure, too. So I was thinking, you know, like how we've done uh, a lot of focus on Nick Cage, it's time for us to finally dive into another pretty significant actor, uh, Jackie Chan. Oh, with uh-huh. what? Yeah, so I was thinking, uh, why don't I recommend what's widely considered to be his best Hong Kong film and what's widely considered to be his best American film, and they're both cop-related things, which, you know, makes the comparison pretty easy. And yeah, I guess we can, like, uh, talk about the differences between filmmaking. So uh, I'm recommending Rush Hour and Police Story. Ah! Oh, Rush Hour's a good one. 
Yeah, now I've already seen both of these films. Um, but yeah, you know, I figured why not do it again. Right. It's okay. been a while since I've seen Police Story, and uh, I like the first two Rush Hour movies. I've never seen Rush Hour three, but you know, Rush Hour one is you know particularly strong. King of China or Hong Kong, either works. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, that that's it. I don't, I don't have anything else to add. I don't know what's what the All right, is. so. Next up is Rush Hour and Police Story. So, this has been It's Always Sunny in Hollywood. Till next time, stay golden. Stay gold. Yeah. (laughs)